Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Child's Play 2, released in 1990, two years to the day after the original. With the massive success of the first movie, a sequel was inevitable, but not for United Artists, the studio that made the original. They were being acquired by Australian company Quintex Group, who thought horror movies would be a bad look for them. Thanks to a call from Steven Spielberg, the Chucky rights went to Universal, where they remain today. The original film's rights would stay with MGM, which is is what allowed them to do the 2019 remake. Series creator Don Mancini returned to write the screenplay, this time receiving sole screenwriting credit. His script moved Chucky out of the city and into the suburbs, with production filming at Universal Studios in California. It's a setting change that works, though I do miss Chicago and all the on-location exterior shots that lent the first film so much character. Mancini was joined by his pal and Chucky's designer, producer David Kirshner. Since Kirshner wanted to avoid tension with the director, like he had on the first film with Tom Holland, Nope, not that one. He chose a friend to direct the sequel, John Lafia, who had done a pass on the first movie script. Lafia got along better with Kirshner and Mancini, and together they decided on a much more stylized look. As opposed to the first movie's natural lighting, Child's Play 2 has harsher shadows and a lot more color all over the place. Lafia also helped create the movie's award-winning music box ad campaign. Sorry, Jack. Chucky's back. At times, however, Lafia's shots feel limited and repetitive. So many are long and unbroken, occasionally with wonky blocking. And I get a little tired of all the wide-lens, low-angle shots with something huge in the foreground. It's relentless. But that's literally all I have to say that's negative about this movie. Child's Play 2 fucking rules, thanks to its characters, the incredible final act, and the much more prominent presence of Chucky. I think the unseen mystery of the killer doll works perfectly for the first film. For a sequel, though, I want to see him right off off the bat, and Child's Play 2 delivers. That little bastard's everywhere, yet doesn't overstay his welcome. This movie clocks in at a cool 84 minutes, and only 10 of those are spent on Chucky's incantation dictation. Give me the power, I beg of you! While Chuck provides the movie's blood, its heart comes courtesy of Andy Barkley and his new foster sister Kyle. Christine Elise is perfect as the tough, jaded teenager who warms up to her little brother, and Child's Play struck gold with Alex Vincent twice in a row. He was able to evolve from the innocent, cute kid he was at six into a world-weary, beat-down, honestly morose eight-year-old. It doesn't matter. Wherever I go, Chucky will find me. Alex Vincent remembers feeling like the sequel's success was his responsibility, even as a seven-year-old actor. This fucking thing depends on me. Um, the first one was a hit. Can I make it a hit again? I'm older now. I'm not as cute as I was. Well, who could be, Alex? The first two Child's Play movies are both very strong, each in their own unique way. But lending a huge hand to both is Alex Vincent's kid acting. Chucky would not have been a phenomenon without Andy Barkley to play off of. The first movie only had five kills, which seems like Child's Play. Let's find out if Chucky can outdo himself when he doesn't have to hide half the film. The movie begins with an eyeball! Chucky's getting fixed up, so he'll look nice and proper for this movie's title card! Doll really needed it, too. Been way more than six months since his last checkup. What I love about this credit sequence is that it shows a bit of the work that goes into making something tangible. Sure, the plastic doll they're constructing here is nowhere near the mechanical marvel that is the Chucky animatronic. But it's still a nice reminder that the practical things you see require lots of effort and care. I always like to acknowledge that. A limo pulls up to the good guy factory and drops off off Play Pal CEO Mr. Sullivan. In a Sorkin style walk and talk, we learn the Andy Barkley incident has caused the company some trouble. They mention that the police have denied seeing what they did, something hinted towards in the last movie. You believe me now? Yeah. But who's gonna believe me? As for Karen Barkley, who would never betray her son like that. She backed up her boy's story in court, so now she's under psychiatric observation. Originally, Karen and Officer Norris were supposed to appear in a court scene, but it was cut just before filming began. Katherine Hicks still spent a lot of time on set, visiting her husband Kevin Yeager, who returned as Chucky's lead puppeteer. Sullivan's skeevy, waddle-loving, knee-pit-fondling little toady is Matson, who shows off how they've rebuilt the Chucky doll. Better, stronger, faster. All to appease the stockholders 
shoulders and show that nothing is wrong. I'm not entirely sure how Charles Lee Ray's soul transfers into it though. I guess it has the same servo motors? I don't know man, just go with it. Turns out the eyes are the windows to Chucky's soul and a double pane to the doll technician. Electric currents surge through a machine and cook this guy's goose before tossing him through a window. Hell yeah! I love it. Although, like with Ardmore in the last movie, I could do with a bit better death face makeup. Sullivan yells at Matson for his ridiculously large tie and tells him to make sure the stockholders don't find out about this mishap. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you want me to do with the doll? Stick it up your ass. Chucky's head way too big to be doing that, dude. A now eight-year-old Andy Barkley is in the foster system, where he's set to be taken care of by Joanne and Phil Simpson. They're apparently MVP foster parents, but Phil could have fooled me. This guy's got resting grimace face and is not an attentive driver. Careful, man. You don't want to kill Andy Barkley. That's someone else's job. Joanne Simpson is played by Jenny Agater, who wasn't an American werewolf in London. Stay tuned. Phil Simpson is played by veteran actor Garrett Graham, who we saw in a bit part way back in Chopping Mall. They take the little traveling salesman to their absolute nightmare of a home. I know I ragged on Karen Barkley's bedroom in the last movie, but the Simpson home is hideous maximalist. Why is it so pink? It looks like if the bunny costume from A Christmas Story were a room. It looks like a room from an extended cut of Squid Game. It looks like what you'd see after clicking a Zillow link that said open for a surprise. It's also the worst possible place for a child to be. Like, why are you keeping your fragiles on tables that are specifically kid height? You wouldn't do that with all those Mickey Mouse collectibles, Joanne. This look and feel was purposefully done by production designer Evo Cristante, who also brought Perfection Nevada to life when he worked on Tremors, which came out the same year. Combining his work with trick angles, it makes everything feel like it's from a kid's perspective. That's why we get all those extra large objects shot with wide lenses from low angles. This childlike tone is supported by Grem Revelle's score, which memorably uses a lot of music boxes. <laughs> Andy's introduced to Kyle, another kid the Simpsons are fostering. She's played by Christina Lease, who is similar to the character in real life. She describes it as tough chick with a heart of gold. She also said she had to be on her game acting opposite a doll. As the actor in the scene with him, you have to be 100% on your game in every single take, because the take that he gets right is the one they're going to use. No matter what, if you sucked horribly, but the doll got it, that's the one they're going to use. Andy's room here is pretty dope, with about a thousand bucks worth of toys waiting for him. Too bad there's also a good guy with a a swanton from the top shelf! By God! That doll is broken in half! Of course, this isn't Chucky. It's Tommy! So try to stifle the trauma there, champ. Matson leaves the factory for a shift at Grace Lone Memorial, but not before taking care of Chucky. Hopefully not in the way Sullivan told him to. Told you, man, that head's too big for all that. As Matson stops for drinky poos, Chucky takes advantage of his car phone and calls up Grace Poole, the head of the foster home, on the world's largest red telephone. Thing feels like it'd be a prop in a They Might Be Giants music video, just as soon as Big Brother was done using it. Chucky finds out where Andy is located simply by saying he's his Uncle Charles. Great security there, Grace Poole, but I guess to Jane Eyre is human. To get a warm-up killing, Chucky threatens Matson from the back seat of his car. I know it's supposed to be like Matson doesn't know who has a gun up to his face, but this still comes off as a dude who's completely nonchalant at the sight of a sentient doll. Hey, take it easy, take it easy. Please don't, don't shoot. Chucky doesn't shoot, bullets that is, but he does come closer to being the Lakeshore Strangler again when he suffocates Matson with the most beautiful thing he's ever seen. At this point, Chucky's still not doing one-liners after each kill. A simple evil laugh suffices for now. <laughs> Chucky first person runs his way to the Simpsons home, but skips the couch gag to listen as Joanne sings her little railway child to sleep. <laughs> Sounds like he's a fan of Outlander. Chucky finds out his ex got a new man who looked just like him, and he fixes that problem by smashing Tommy's face with a porcelain tchotchke. Hope that wasn't meant to be mean, since Tommy's named after the first movie's director, Tom Holland. Still not that one. Chucky buries Tommy's corpse beneath the backyard swing in a cool overhead shot that uses the returning Ed Gale in a costume. There are way fewer shots with Gale in Child's Play 2, since director John LaFia didn't like how they looked in the original movie. He instead wanted to rely on the improved animatronics, which used smaller motors, fewer cables, and more computer assistance. Unlike in the first movie, where Brad Dourif had to overdub Jessica Walters' lines, he recorded Chucky's dialogue ahead of production, so they could match the doll's mouth movements to it on set. A, B, C, D. The kids get in trouble for the broken statue, and Andy overhears Phil talking shit about him. He may need more, uh, 
attention than we can give him. This is another example of this movie's weird blocking. This kid would clearly be visible to them, but at the end of this long shot, he just walks out the door and gets completely ignored like they never even saw him there. I don't know, maybe they just don't care about him. After all, they keep the poor kid's trigger around. Watch it there, Chuckster. He almost blew it. Good thing he remembered to put batteries in his back, or else Andy would have caught him just like his mama did. Although his foster parents kind of suck, at least his foster sister Kyle is cool. She's so cool, she smokes. But that is not behavior to emulate, young man. Didn't you watch the cartoon All Stars? The relationship between Andy and Kyle is one of my favorite parts of this whole series. Andy Barkley is mature for his age, but as he's grown older, that intelligence has given way to somberness. Only eight, Andy's already learned how unfair the world can be. Enter Kyle, who's been hardened after bouncing around the foster system, but whose cool exterior isn't immune to Andy and his charms. Wanna hear me say your name backwards? Kyle. She grows to respect him enough to offer him real-world advice instead of talking down to him like a little kid. The only one I can count on is myself. Okay, and you have to learn that now. It's also nice to hear that Christina Lee and Alex Vincent got along like real siblings on set. Night comes, and Chucky makes like a Lilliputian, tying Andy to the bed with jump ropes. He's finally revealed himself, because much like Jigsaw, he wants to play a game. It's called Hide the Soul, and guess what? You're it. Oh cool, new game! How do we play? Party to we Dembella. Aw, Chucky. I saw this one. Kyle comes in from her dates with Dylan and then Brandon, and I guess assumes Andy did this to himself? What, uh, what kind of stuff are you into there, Kyle? I love how Andy punches Chucky down as soon as he's untied. I also love all of Kyle's reactions in this scene. You actually tied this child up so we wouldn't tell on you, is that it? Oh, come on, Chucky Phil. did it. That's enough Chucky. now. Andy and his totally badass dinosaur shirt are safe for now, but Chucky will have to win himself some hide the soul soon. He's already turning human again in his new doll body. The next day, Kyle and Andy are walking the streets of Haddonfield. What are you looking for? The boogeyman. Kyle meets up with a long-haired Zorin, and Andy heads off to school on the bus, not knowing that Chucky's hitched a ride to join him. Glad he's coming, though. Andy needs a better dodgeball opponent than this stupid fence. Andy's teacher, Ms. Kettlewell, is the average shitty adult in his life, and after doubting his commitment to sparkle motion, things get worse when she sees his paper with a note from Chucky, or possibly Freddy Krueger. Bitch. Kettlewell is played by Beth Grant, who was told to take the role by her friend Dinah Madoff, Aunt Maggie from the first film. Grant took inspiration for her character from Nancy Reagan, which matched the just say no button she was given by the costume department. In another example of how Don Mancini treats his cast and crew like a family, he went to Grant's house after her daughter was born and cooked grits for the new mother. Grant's husband Michael Chifo was then cast as a security guard in Child's Play 3. He's family, like he makes everybody family. Kettlewell locks Andy in the classroom, possibly as a sacrifice to Willy Weasel, and while she's gone, Chucky starts screaming from the closet. Andy's like, thanks, I'm out of peace. Give me the fuck out! Nah, man, you scary. Kettlewell returns and thinks it's Andy in the closet, so she opens the door and gets attacked by Chucky, who's gonna pop her up. In two absolutely awesome displays of Chucky's animatronics, he stalks towards a terrified Ms. Kettlewell. He kills her with a yardstick. Yes, a yardstick, not a ruler. In a series of shots that pull out with each strike. Great bit of direction there. Those two shots of Chucky were his so-called showcase shots, designed by John LaFia to highlight the amazing animatronics. While I'd say it was worth it, LaFia spent so much time on those two shots that production fell behind schedule. This caused a number of problems, including last-minute script rewrites that cut character moments for Phil and Joanne. Garrett Graham and Jenny Agutter were reportedly pissed about it. Mancini says Agutter once called this movie the low point of her career. She was not a happy camper on that movie because, you know, the script, she, she lost what, she, you know, for her were some crucial scenes to her character. That night, knowing Chucky has returned to the basement, Andy takes things into his own hands with an electric knife. Haha, <laughs> look at me, I'm Leatherface! The noise is heard by Phil, who's already an ardent the critic of Andy. He comes downstairs right as Andy scares Chucky away, so all he sees is a cute kid with a knife. He doesn't see Chucky hooking his leg from beneath, knocking him down the stairs. How's it hanging, Phil? The quips begin! Chucky drops him on his tech neck, killing him instantly. Horrific for Joanne to find her husband as a pile of dead beef. The the 
accident turns her against Andy once and for all. Get away from me! Grace Poole shows up to take Andy back to the foster home, so he says goodbye to Kyle and the bubblegum vomit house. He warns her about Chucky on his way out, so later she tosses the doll in the trash like a creep show comic. But what's this? Beneath the swing, the Tommy good guy with his face smashed in? Perhaps Andy was right after all. With Chucky having vacated Oscar's Airbnb, Kyle arms herself and heads upstairs, following the sound of a sewing machine. She finds Joanne dead and bound, with red paint on her neck. Oh, I guess her throat slit, and she's so pale. Chucky jumps out, and Kyle puts up a fight, but he eventually gets the upper hand. Still working on the whole quip thing, though. Bitch, you hurt me. Chuck forces Kyle to drive him to the Foster building, which gives us more great Chucky moments. I especially like when a traffic cop gets excited to see a good guy doll. What is your name, buddy? Chucky. <laughs> We also get a reference to Don Mancini's original script, back when it was called Blood Buddies. You seen dolls that pee? This one bleeds. In that version of Child's Play, Chucky was called Buddy, and had synthetic blood, like how some real-life dolls can pee. Andy mixed his blood into the doll, which came to life as his murderous id, killing people whom Andy was mad at. Child's Play 2 was a chance for Don Mancini to almost reboot his original script. It's why it downplays the voodoo aspect, even though they had to stick with the incantation stuff to maintain continuity. As stated previously, Mancini was never a fan. But oh, it's I'm into crying. Oh, it's well, stupid. <laughs> But you embraced it. Ade Due Tempola. But you, yeah, yes, we had yes. No, no choice but to embrace it. Mancini was also more involved with production. During the first movie, a writer's strike prevented him from being on set. For Child's Play 2, he was welcomed there by director John LaFia. Mancini and many others described John LaFia as a sweet, sensitive, somewhat soft man. He was a bit inexperienced as a director, and when the film fell behind schedule, the financiers began to complain. David Kirshner remembers comforting LaFia as he started to crack under the pressure. I just remember one day just holding him as, as he sobbed, and uh, he was a very sensitive person, as, <laughs> you know, uh, our group is. We tragically lost John Lafia in 2020 when he died of suicide by hanging. Rest in peace, man. Kyle uses physics to rid herself of the killer doll, but she's overzealous trying to crush him with the car. She loses track of him, leading to the second scene in four minutes to end with Chucky holding a knife to her neck. At least this time, he's got a better quip. Playtime's over. Catchphrase. They go to the foster home and empty it out using a fire alarm, kinda like the ending of Kindergarten Cop. And then Andy enters the scene wearing the exact exact same outfit as Miko Hughes in Kindergarten Cop? I'm seeing that accurately, right? I don't have a tumor or anything? It's not a tumor. Okay, good. Continuing the trend of this movie's adults being crappy, Grace Poole has no big love for Kyle, so she blames and berates her for the fire alarm stunt. Try not to hold a grudge, lady. Grace Poole is played by Grace Zabriskie, who was in Twin Peaks and who was recently the fortune teller in The Quarry. Cool! Still gotta finish that playthrough. In The Office, Grace has barely begun her scolding when Chucky attacks and kills her by stabbing her in the chest. Yo, we heard you like Dead Grace Face, so we got Dead Grace Face to go on your Dead Grace Face! Chucky separates Kyle from Andy so he can bully the poor kid. Snap out of it! You act like you've never seen a dead body before! He holds Andy at knife point and they hop a ride on the Newsy Express! Kyle gets in her car for a chase scene where somehow a doll and a small child don't tumble out of a speeding vehicle. And I mean speeding! Damn, truck driver! Why you doing 80 on a service road? Kyle gets him to pull over so she can follow Andy and Chucky into the best possible setting for a Chucky finale, the Good Guy Doll Factory. Her badass entrance kicks off 15 whole minutes in this place. I love it! This was the setting for the ending in Mancini's original draft for the first movie. Like I said, he's great at recycling unused ideas. His original script also had Chucky attacking a teacher and more focus on the toy company, two ideas that both made their way into the sequel. The Play Pals Company's Good Guy Factory has a freaking maze of dolls in it. It's basically the shiny hedge maze with good guys. Why has Halloween Horror Nights not done this yet? Chucky knocks out Andy with a weak-ass strut and gets to saying the magic words. Adi Dewey Dembella, give me the power I beg of you. Yep, in come the Chucky clouds. I should have known. Felt it in my knees yesterday. Chucky actually does his incantation for the full duration, but after it's over, Andy's still Andy and Chucky's still Chucky. Sorry, pal. No 80s body swap comedy shenanigans for you. No! You really can't overstate how amazing Brad Dorif is as Chucky. What the hell?
<laughs> Kyle and Andy regroup and say their secret trust words. Andy, Kyle. Okay, I guess they're not that secret. They get lost in this crazy work hazard of a floor setup that would make a forklift driver go insane. A bunch of fun factory stuff gets used, making the most out of this location. Andy somehow avoids pinching his fingers in those DZ rollers, and the siblings manage to trap Chucky by the hand. It doesn't stop him for long, way shorter than 127 hours. He frees himself and makes some lemonade, going from good guy to groovy guy with a knife hand. Kyle and Andy are able to get through the Geonosian Battle Droid Factory, but are unable to find any exit. Can you say Triangle Shirtwaist Factory? Their disruption causes a pileup, alerting the one and only worker in this giant factory. The tech heads to the floor and clears the line, only for Chucky to slice him back into the eye-placing machine, giving him a death that is permanently seared into my memory. Absolutely hideous. The Good Guy Factory is another creation by production designer Evo Cristante. While the exterior shots use the factory in Long Beach, the interiors were all done on a massive soundstage in Santa Clarita. Cristante basically made a real factory from scratch, with a whole bunch of moving and working parts. His design helps make up for this movie's loss of on-location shooting. Chucky's next attack on the kids ends quickly, with him being stitched to a platform. They send the belt backwards and into a little incubator, which is apparently where they make their Mortal Kombat collector action figures. The melted heap that comes out isn't pretty, and sorry machine, I don't think hair will make it any better. But this pile of plastic's not Chucky. He's escaped, and now he manages to knock Kyle out with the technician's body, which he somehow rigged up like a haunted house scare. Seriously, how'd he do that? A now legless Chucky wheels up to Andy and slashes at him, but maybe he should stick to the strangling that supposedly made him famous. He gets trapped, and Andy opens up a pipe of, oh my god, it's damp! The molten plastic covers Chucky, giving Andy enough time to save Kyle from a decapitation. Of course, Chucky's known to survive a cavalcade of attacks, so he comes back for one more hit hideous, melty baby scare. Kyle sticks an air hose in his mouth, which fills his cheeks until he looks like Pops from Regular Show. Then his fucking head blows up, and it's awesome. Seriously, that shit is fantastic. And the bloody, headless, melted doll corpse left behind? Oh man, chef's kiss. This explosion is an homage to the ending of Brian De Palma's The Fury. It's even shot the same, from a bunch of different angles. The movie ends with Andy and Kyle leaving the good guy factory and heading to no home in particular, since they, uh, don't really have one. Pretty sad. How many corpses did our returning good guy doll manufacture? Let's grab Chucky and find out at the numbers. Oh, Chucky, how'd you get over here, man? Wait, you're not Chucky. You're Tommy! Ah! Ah! There were eight kills in Child's Play 2, consisting of three women and five men, including Chucky the doll. If you give him credit for the technician killed in the beginning, then we can add seven more kills to Chucky's count. Two more with a knife, one more electrocution and bludgeoning each, an asphyxiation, a neck snap, and a, uh, eye gouge. We'll call that miscellaneous. Also, this sequel had three more kills than the first movie. We'll track that too. With a runtime of 84 minutes, we had a kill on average every 10 and a half minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to the factory technician, turned into Kimmy Goodman by a good guy. This kill impacted me more than any other I can think of, except for maybe Drew Barrymore in Scream and the Jason X face mask. Doll Machete for lamest kill will go to Joanne, when her life clock crystal turned black. The whole thing is kinda goofy looking, even if I appreciate the sewing sound effects used to build tension. And for Chucky movies, I'm giving out the champion chuckle for funniest part. This time it goes to the traffic stop instant, because of Brad Dourif's hilarious deadpan delivery. What is your name, buddy? Chucky. <laughs> And that's it. Child's Play 2 came out in 1990, and while I once said it was my favorite of the series, I think now it might be tied with the original. They both fucking rule, though. Until next time, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. On the next Kill Count. I don't know if you have heard. I don't know if you have heard. It's time to recount Chucky the Third. It's time to recount Chucky the Third. Child's Play 3 is an uneven and rushed sequel, made in less than a year. You're a fucking drag, you know that? It jumps the timeline eight years into the future. Andy, how you've grown. And moves our toy soldier from the factory to a military academy. This means war. The setting is uninspired, and some of the characters are pretty one note. Um. But we've still got Brad Dourif's foul mouth. Don't fuck with the chuck. Charles. Stop swearing. And a carnival finale that would make P.T. Barnum proud. <laughs> Tell me about it. So grab your gun. This is my rifle. This is my gun. Er, rifle. And watch Child's Play 3. And on Sunday, tune in for the Kill Count Recount. Only on Dead Meat. Don't worry. 
I've been here before. Child's Play 3 can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Demi always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before its kill count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this kill count recount. Really happy with the response I got for the Child's Play recount. Sure, there will always be people who don't really get what I'm doing here, but I think most of you do. And I appreciate your support in me wanting to have the best episodes for these awesome movies. I mean, on some level, the kill count is kind of my legacy, I guess. So I just want to make sure that I'm leaving something good behind. The originals were fine, but you know, I like these more. I want to thank some patrons like Sunny D, Tian Barfield, Haunt the Guy, Kristen Beck, Psych Hash, Quinn MC Gaming, Samara Nira, and Sweet D. Thanks everyone. Be good people.